First of all, our first panellist will actually be Professor um, Sanford Borens. Uh, Sanford Borens is a professor of management at the University of Toronto. He writes, blogs and teaches about narrative, information technology and innovation. Ooh. Secondly, we have um, Professor Rob Fitzgerald. Um, Rob is a professor of, the education at, professor of Education at the University of Canberra, right here, has been a leader and innovator in the field of information and communication technology education for over 20 years, and is internationally recognised for his research and development work in computer-based learning, social media and mobile learning, and a huge personal thank you from all the team for him doing such an enormous job helping us with this today and for sponsoring this event. Um, Dr. Sarah Pearson uh, is the CEO of ANU Enterprise, a visiting fellow for the College of Business and Economics and the Australian Universe National University. Uh, so Enterprise, uh, ANU Enterprise Proprietary Limited is a company wholly owned by the Australian National University and dedicated to the application and commercialisation of knowledge generated within the university. She's also a visiting fellow at the ANU's College of Business and Economics. We have Dr. Math Mark Matthews, uh, is a senior member of the Crawford School of Public Policy team that manages the Commonwealth UN ANU strategic relationship. This collaborative activity, which spans teaching, research and engagement, aims to improve the connections between government, policymaking and academic expertise. Uh, next we have Sa Dr. Sam Bicolo. Um, it has 20 years experience as an industrial designer, design facilitator and mentor working within academia, startups, SMEs and the corporate sector. Uh, we've got their entire bios up on the website as well, so I'm just going to give you the sort of one-line introductions. Um, professor Deborah Blackman is the Director, Graduate Research Officer and Professor of Management in the Faculty of Business and Government, University of Canberra. Uh, Deborah's academic background is in the organisational learning, human resource management and development, as well as management of change and organisational behaviour. And finally, the University Distinguished Professor Ken Friedman is uh, the Dean of, of the Faculty of Design at Swinburne University of Technology in Melbourne, Australia. He works at the intersection of three fields, design, management and art. He's been a professor at the Norwegian School of Management um, at the Danish Design School and the Danish Centre for Design Research in Copenhagen. Uh, my name is Pia War. I will be your chair for this session and um, we will run through them all. They'll all give five to ten minutes and then we should probably hopefully closer to five and then we'll take some questions at the end. So please start thinking about questions because we would love to have a, a good interactive discussion with some of these leaders in uh, innovative public service innovation. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, if I, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. San, uh, Sanford Borens to speak first. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pia. Um, I was asked to talk about uh, collaboration between academics and practitioners in the area of innovation. Um, before I get to that, I uh, wanted to um, give you some reactions from uh, afar, as it were, um, to the presentations I just heard in the earlier panel. The first thing that struck me and impressed me was the strength of Australia's uh, um, development of op open data and uh, commitment to uh, social media. That, that, was, that was very impressive. I was also impressed by GovHack. Um, and I must say that uh, last weekend, certainly the weather cooperated, so uh, there were fewer alternatives uh, for uh, um, people to, uh, to amuse themselves otherwise than participating in GovHack. I must say the question I have about GovHack, though, is um, it seems like a great starting point, but what comes next? Will there be more gov hacks, or um, has this uh, s stimulated an appetite for gov hacking um, on the part of uh, Australian uh, te technologically uh, adept uh, teenagers? And I, I hope the latter, and I hope that there will be um, lots more interesting applications that come out of the uh, spirit of gov hack. Um, I was impressed uh, to hear Julie, uh, Julie Harris mention that the uh, Australian Bureau of Statistics makes its data available for free. Uh, I would comment that that's precisely what the United States does um, to their credit. And I should also say that is entirely what Statistics Canada, Canada's statistics agency, does not do. It sees uh, um, data as a source of revenue generation, and I think that is a misguided policy. Um, I noted uh, Monique Potts' comments of, uh, about uh, her work in the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. 
Uh, I'm glad to hear that uh, employees there get 20% uh, Google time to uh, develop uh, new projects, pro product, projects. I think that's really important. Uh, I noticed that she also said that uh, the ABC has a lack of resources for real research and development. Um, from what I've seen in various other contexts, um, that's a common problem throughout the public sector in many other places. And the monetary resources for research and development also often come out of um, what we sort of refer to as organizational slack, slush funds that uh, ma managers have. And I would comment that as governments move into the age of austerity, the uh, representatives of the treasury usually are very good at pouncing on those uh, little pots of uh, discretionary resources and the result of their pouncing on their resources is uh, that there's less innovation because uh, the resource support for innovation disappears. Um, so those were my immediate reactions to what I just heard earlier this morning. A little bit about collaboration with academics. Um, there are a group of academics who study innovation in government. Um, that's been uh, uh, my focus for quite a few years now. Um, I've had the good fortune to be associated with the Harvard Kennedy School, and in particular their Innovations in American Government Awards. And they've sort of taken me on as the house academic. They've made their data, in particular their application forms, which are very comprehensive. They've made that available to me to study. They've also provided uh, um, a measure of monetary support, and that's been very important with my research. Um, so what would I say to practitioners who want to collaborate with academics who are interested in, in studying innovation? What I would say is make yourself available. Uh, make yourself available in terms of making your data available. I'm not necessarily talking about data, data sets, but uh, you know, um, other uh, more sort of in internal data about, uh, for instance, uh, sort of how, you can, how, how your innovations came about, what, what the process was. Um, if they want to interview you, make yourself available. Answer their questionnaires. Um, if, uh, if you run innovation awards, and I heard a m mention of the excellence in e-government awards, um, those are a fertile source of, of, uh, uh, of data for research. So make make that data available to, to academics. I'd also say involve academics. If you're running awards um, and you need people on a judging panel, look for a researcher who has an interest in that topic. Um, and if you need sort of advisors about uh, the process or the content of, uh, uh, of innovation, again, turn to, uh, uh, turn, turn to the academic sector. You won't be disappointed. So I think there's um, great potential for collaboration between uh, um, practitioners who are doing innovative things and academics who are studying the process to find out uh, um, how, how, to, how, to, how to innovate effectively and how to gener generalize from uh, the cases that, uh, that you present. Thank you very much. Next, I would like to introduce Dr. Sarah Pearson. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, I did read the agenda this morning and realised we're going to have to say something, so I just have a few points <laughs> that I scribbled down this morning. I'd just like to start by saying I perhaps have a bit of an unusual perspective on innovation uh, because I have been involved right the way along the value chain, the innovation value chain, and I think that's quite an unusual place to have been. So I have been an academic researcher researching in the physical sciences and patenting my ideas and then trying to commercialise them, so I understand how how hard all of that is. And then I've also been a global head of open innovation at Cadbury, where my job then was to take the ideas and then actually try to properly commercialize them. People tend to think that once a university gets it out of the door, then that's it, job done and dusted. But actually, there's an awful long way to go once you get into industry to actually make it into a viable product. I've also had a tiny bit of experience in uh, government innovation. I um, led Prime Minister Science, Engineering and Innovation Council for a while. And I'm really thrilled to be able to say, finally, after two years, one of the reports that we presented to the Prime Minister is now coming to reality, and we're going to see something happening, um, which is quite unique from PIMSEC, I believe. So there is a bit of innovation in, in there. And I have also been involved uh, with helping government groups 
in Australia take on the open innovation approach. Now, for those of you who don't know what open innovation is, it's basically connected and collaborative. It's all about living, breathing, existing in an innovation ecosystem that does not comprise your mates or the people just down the corridor. It comprises a global ecosystem of ideas that, that you live in. So having been in these different places, um, you might be asking, well, why am I here to, talking to you? Because you're public sector innovation people, so what on earth has my experience got to do with that? Well, what I've noticed is that innovation is actually very similar wherever you do it and whatever bit you're doing it with. And I would like to say that um, one of the key mistakes that people make about innovation is not realising that it's strategic and it needs to be driven by strategy. Uh, we heard earlier about you know, having your little R&D, um, bits of money on the side and, and activity on the side. No, innovation is a strategic initiative. You as an organisation think strategically about what you're trying to achieve, what are your goals, how are you going to achieve those, and some of those will be through innovation. And I'd also say that um, the other things that are similar are it's a culture. Being innovative is actually a way of being. In an innovative person, you don't make people innovative, people are innovative. I mean, you can help people become innovative, I'm not going to get into that culture, uh, etc., uh, nature-nurture argument, but it is about a way of being, and I personally think it's a really, really exciting way of being, and in fact, it's how humans have evolved. Um, so get with evolution. Um, I think other principles are that innovation is about change. I'm, I'm lucky, I love change, but most people find change very scary. But if you're going to innovate, it's going to involve change. So you really have to address, address that issue. Some people can see it as a waste of time, too, because of this issue, whoops, issue of having it on the side. You know, it's, innovation needs to be part of everything that you do, the way that you see things. Um, and yet people seem to think that uh, it's not part of their day job. They have a day job. They have some things to deliver. And this innovation is just something added that's a bit of a waste of time. Those things need to be addressed if you're going to become an innovative organisation. Um, and then I was involved in open innovation, as I said, which is basically looking outside for ideas. So you can go and talk to your other mates in the public service and think you've got all the, all the ideas in the world, but actually there's a lot of people out there who will also have fantastic ideas. And if you really want to be innovative and deliver results, be effective and efficient, you need to be looking outside and collaborating with people outside. So we were talking about collaborating around innovation research. Uh, certainly collaborate around innovative research. I would make a point to that, though. Don't just think that academics have all the answers around innovation. In fact, my experience is in, in a number of areas, practitioners are way ahead of the re researchers in terms of innovation, advancement and knowledge and understanding. Um, and I spent a lot of time as global head of open innovation talking to other global heads of open innovation about what they were learning because at that forefront, um, you can be way ahead of, of the, the academics. So don't make the mistake of just thinking you go to academics, bring academics and practitioners together. Um, one way of getting around these challenges is to change the goalpost. I'm a very goal-driven person. I see a goal, I don't really care how I get to that goal or who comes with me to get to that goal, but I want to get to that goal. So my advice to you as the public sector would be think about your goals and think about how you get to those. Don't get hung up about it was my idea or we have to do this. It's what is your goal and how are you going to get there um, and collaborate with people as much as you can to get there. Um, the last thing I'd like to say is that I'm seeing a bit of a change in the literature, which I think is really exciting. It's actually a little slight move away from this word innovation. I know people are sort of getting a bit uptight about, well, what does this word innovation mean? I'm seeing it move to um, elastic organisations. So an elastic organisation is one that's flexible and sustainable. And it lives as I was talking, which is what are our goals? What are we trying to deliver? And not, do we, not even what do we think we need to deliver. What do our clients, customers, stakeholders think we should be delivering? And how are we going to show value? And then arrange yourselves around doing that. And it will change. So don't arrange yourself around some particular way and think that's why it's going to be for the rest of you your life, your working life, you need to be much more flexible and we need to be constantly changing and adapting. Um, and that's going to involve goal, or goal orientation and a dynamic, excited, engaged workforce. And my understanding from the literature is if you start to be innovative, you will get an engaged, dynamic, delivering workforce. So um, on that note, I wish you all the very best and would love to help you in any way that I can. I'd like to invite to the panel uh, Dr. Mark Matthews. Thank you.
Thank you. The um, notion of an elastic organisation and university is a sort of interesting uh, combination. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you, you're well positioned. Uh, I don't think I work in a very elastic context. Um, so th what I do in my job at the Crawford School of Public Policy is I run a um, basically think tank activities which are funded by government and they're about government academic partnerships. I just want to make very briefly, because the clock's been ticking on this session, so I'll probably um, be fairly brief, just want to talk about some thinking we've been doing in partnership with government officials um, on, I mean, given that we do experimental and exploratory work in partnership, we share the risk. What we, we have an appetite for risk, which we sort of manage jointly. And I want to talk about some of the, where we're thinking of going in this. One perspective on the um, public sector innovation agenda is that, you know, th there's a wave of stuff that I think we're hearing a lot about today, which is really good stuff. It's about using IT better, better integrated data, meshing that with government business processes, open innovation dimensions, a whole set of things which are... I see as extracting the potential from existing thinking, particularly in terms of learning from how the private sector innovates, and also civil society, we shouldn't forget. We've been doing some thinking in partnership with um, the people in some key departments in government, in the federal government, about what the next wave after that might look like. And I just really share some of that thinking with you. And the line goes like this. Um, one of the issues, government is blamed for being risk averse. Well, Government officials have to, and mechanisms have to be risk averse because the negative unintended consequences of policy settings that are wrong, allowing drugs onto the market that kill people, are very, very damaging. So government is rational to have an immune system that tries to second guess before things hit the market, if that's that part of government that deals with the market, um, problems before they actually have to harm people. There's also the whole national security and pandemic preparedness dealing with catastrophic risks. So you might think, if you think about government as the uncertainty and risk manager of last resort, and when we think about uncertainty and risk, we think it's in that context useful to decouple the two concepts. Uncertainty means we're aware there are issues, but we can't begin to estimate probabilities and likelihoods, and risk is something you can manage. So we think about a spectrum with uncert substantive uncertainty at one end and risk at the other end. Um, and there's also a grey area in between. Most government officials we talk to work in a grey area where they're not quite sure if they have to formally manage risks, because that's what government largely does, um, they're not quite sure how reliable the formal methods they've got, the, the, all the estimates. If they're more at the uncertainty estimate, which is things like counter-terrorism, a whole lot of national security stuff, you're taking both short-term and long-term views where you're, in a sense, and one way of thinking about government funding for research in general, is a process of translating some uncertainty into risk. You can manage risks in various ways, even though they're unpalatable quite often, but you need to translate uncertainty into risk. And that's an area where we think there's a lot of scope, A, for um, possibly a next wave of, innov of innovative activity within government. I'll give you some illustrations of that in a minute. But also an area where we can engage academic expertise and um, the expertise in government much more effectively. Um, so the, just to give you an illustration, um, the kind of thing we're thinking about, um, and this builds on some work myself and some colleagues did for the Australian National Audit Office a few years ago, where we worked on a better practice guide on how you manage the public sector innovation process. And the whole issue emerged there of, in order to innovate, innovate, you need an appetite for risk. What does that appetite for risk look like in a public sector context? We're thinking more now about the uncertainty dimension, and one of the projects that we're sort of ramping up now is to say, well, the national security the intelligence community use formal methods on the whole derived from academia, testing competing hypotheses, evidence for and against, various other methods which are all about the balance of probabilities in working out you know, what is noise and what is a signal in terms of potential national security threat. We think there's a lot of scope for taking those structured methods and actually rolling them out into core public policy domain, given this role of government as uncertainty and risk manager of the last resort. So we're doing some experimental and exploratory work on, because you can apply these methods in programme evaluations, in terms of um, and other stages in the policy cycle. We've got some work underway in the evaluation stage at the moment. It's just saying to what extent, if we adopted these methods that have been tried and tested, albeit with problems in the national security, security community, can we roll those out into the more general policy cycle as a way of improving decision making, making it more nimble, agile, maybe more elastic, um, and obviously that aligns with evidence-based policy making, but it's a bit of a new perspective. And one of the, uh, it, we need to take academic colleagues out of their comfort zone because um, 
they are um, very, very reluctant to generate future scenarios based on their expertise. And that's one thing government wants from the academic research base, is them to stick their neck out and think about future states of the world a bit more. So we're using this as a mechanism to do that. I'll end at that point. Thanks. I'd like to introduce Dr. Sam Bacolo. I, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. My apologies. Well. Oh, good. Thank you very much. So why am I here today? Um, my research, I mean, if you look at my CV, um, it's more around working with businesses to help them innovate. So my background is actually in design-led innovation. And how do you embed this capability inside firms to actually build this resilience to actually ch in changing economic conditions for them to innovate? And I suppose how this relates to what you've been doing or, or in public sector innovation is what Sarah said. Innovation is similar across many different domains. So for a lot of you, you've all used d design in some way. Now, I'm not talking about design as a physical artifact or a manifestation of, of the outcome. It's around design thinking. So how do you actually embed this capability inside a firm to allow them to fail fast? How do you build this ability to actually prototype your ideas beyond just the known with it? So my work is really getting this capability inside firms and this maturity to actually raise their level of risk taking to actually take new ideas to the market. So what we do know from our research is the biggest challenge inside any organisation is management capability. That's the largest blocker that we have to address. So how do we overcome this is actually getting companies to actually build upon this knowledge of, of um, design thinking or design processes, but not at one level, but at all levels of the organisation. And then, now that's critical. We also know it's much easier inside a company to actually focus on the knowns. When you've actually got a clear brief of what the problem is, you can focus on these technology solutions or you can focus on actually directing resources. But unfortunately, what that often leads to are solutions that actually are looking for problems. So where is it they're actually trying to find the source of innovation that goes beyond just the known? And how do you actually start the challenge? So in my role, we have design-led innovation. And it's a three-step process by saying, we need a vision for growth based on deep customer insights. Who is your customer? And what do you really know about them? Now, it's a business term. You can use your own term there. How do you grow that insight? Through co-designing with your customers. OK, and what is it that you're actually working with them? And the third one this is what Sarah is relating to, this elastic organisation. How do you map these insights to all parts of your business? Because it will change your business significantly. It won't be the same business you're working towards. So the three takeaways I'd like you to share with you is you need capability inside your own departments. So innovation isn't a department on its own. It's everyone's responsibility inside the organisation. And so universities are great to actually help with that leadership and actually grow those capabilities inside your own, your own departments. It's focusing on the customer. So having these deep customer insights. Now, I saw on the previous presentations this morning about um, surveys and focus groups, and they're great to have when you get to a really known problem. But we want to go deeper than that. What's the meaning behind the problems your customers are facing that leads to innovation? And again, universities are a great source of inspiration to actually help with some of these meta-trends, this ethnographic work, or the social sciences. And the final one is, to really get change happening, you need to provoke. And in most businesses, they don't like provoking. You know, it's potentially brand damaging. Um, it's quite difficult to do. And I'm, I'm sure inside government organisations, the same applies. Use universities as a mechanism to help provoke your customers, to actually help test ideas, to actually take small pilots out there in a safe way that you can actually capture some great insights. So they're, they're the three things I'd like to share with you and happy to discuss later on. Thank you very much. I'd like to introduce Professor Deborah Blackman. Thank you. Hi, it's always nice to come on about fifth, because then you can res respond to some of the others as well. I'd like to start with a quick story. About six months ago, bearing in mind the collaboration between universities and um, industry and partners in government, I was asked with a colleague to go and present some results of some research findings to do with how do you do whole of government. And we gave a whole list of suggestions and ideas and what could be done. And at the end, we said, any questions? And the first question was, well, yes, but if we don't want to make any of those changes, how can we make it work? And you know when you look at somebody and you think, did you really ask me that? And they had. 
And I was thinking, what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that one of the difficulties we have, and it picks up on the previous point, is it has to be embedded, it has to be systematic, and it has to be part of your strategy. If it's not, you can't actually get everything to, to pan out the way you want it to. My research is always often about why things don't work. I think it's lovely to keep looking at how we can change things, but sometimes it's really important, and it's not negative, it's really important to understand why, with all the best of intentions, something hasn't happened. And there's six things I'd like to just quickly say today, which I think are some of the key ones. The first one is, when you have a whole group of people in a meeting talking about innovation, ask them all to write down what will be different if you have innovation. It's quite a fun game, and at the end of it, you'll find you've all got a completely different picture of what will be different at the end of it. If you can't do that, you haven't got the same conversation going on in the room. So you actually have to think about what is it you're meaning by those terms. I mean, it's also a fun one to do with motivation as well, by the way. It's a great way to hijack any motivation meeting. Um, because what we do is we close down the system without meaning to. What do I mean by that? Well, we think that we are open to new ideas. And there's this touching faith that we have ideas that something is out there in the ether and we'll bring it in. Actually, most of our judging systems, and it comes back to the risk management that Mark's talking about, mean that we talk about it very seriously, we think about it very carefully, and with very good reasons, we reject it. The other thing we do is we work on what is it we think we need to know. So one of the organizations that I was working with who were really trying to be innovative, and the first thing they did was they sent everybody on a really, really important innovation course. So now everybody has the same set of ideas. So when they sit down, they can all agree with each other beautifully. That's great, but it ain't going to get any novelty. So how are we keeping the system open is actually a really interesting question that we don't always ask ourselves. The need for advocates and champions. We've heard a little bit about that, and we heard that earlier on this morning as well. One of my best favorite examples of this is currently going on in Canada, where they have a lot of peer support and learning for their management teams to enable innovation and to enable growth. They made some very specific choices. They employed somebody to help support that team, not manage it, but support it. And she has a champion, and she has to have that because very frequently people will go, well, that's a lovely idea, but we can't afford it. And so she has to have a champion to go back in and explain why actually we do need her, we do need the network, all of those things if we're going to get novelty. Because one of the other examples is we often try and do things that are different. Um, when they went, when one organization made some enormous changes so that they could go in and make some differences, and they did. And a lot of it was around budgeting, because you know how we always measure everything within an inch of its life every six months or so. Well, they thought maybe, just maybe, they'd do something a bit more novel, and they could move things from budget to budget and so on. It was great, massive innovation. It was all going really well, right up until 12 months later when they put the system back to where it was because actually that had been an exception, not a rule, so now we go back to normal. So everything went back to normal. Every change went back to normal. It was actually quite interesting to track. It went back to normal in about five weeks. It's amazing what can happen. Measuring the wrong things is another one. Right? We measure, how do we measure innovation? Well, a lot of the measures are the wrong ones. So think about it. You get what you measure, always. It's very simple. So if you're getting some odd things, you're measuring some odd things. So think about what, how will you look at it. For me, it's always what does it, should it look like when it works. It's not a conversation we actually talk about that often. But what should it look like? That's a question that's really interesting. And how can we measure that, not what's the training and all of those other kinds of things? And another thing which links to something else that's just been said, if we actually want to have a culture of adoption, we have to support early adoption. I'll give you an example. We had been continually telling people that they should come up with new ideas. So somebody came up with one. Now, it wasn't a terribly good one. I admit that. But it was all their own. And everybody told them how stupid it was. So not only were they never going to do anything again, but nor was anybody else, ever. That was it, gone, any chance. So we need to think about all the things that are happening in our system that are going to enable us to support these things. I agree, most, a lot of people do want to be innovative. Many don't. But they need to know that it's safe to do it. They need to know how they can do it. And the whole system has to be around them to support them to do it. Many years ago, I ran the, my, the university's first successful conference in terms of making money. I was slightly surprised by the email I got to say that I had made a surplus and how was I planning to send the money back. We have moved on, but it took me a year and a half to persuade them I was allowed to keep that money. Thank you. And finally, we actually have University Distinguished uh, Professor Ken Friedman. I'm just going to play your video first and then um, get you up, okay? Just hold on one second.
And I'd now like to introduce Professor Ken Friedman to give our last five minute speech and then we'll go to questions and answers. Thank you. Good morning. Um, when we started this morning, I um, was thinking as I listened to the different speakers about some experiences of my life that have had to do with innovation in the past. I used to be director of something called the Nordic Center for Innovation, a partnership of the Norwegian School of Management, Lund University, and Aalto University, or the predecessor of Aalto. We thought very deeply about innovation. We did very little about it. Uh, however, there was another organization in uh, Oslo at the same time. They were kind of a think tank. I won't name any names. They thought very efficiently about innovation, and they wrote reports for which they got paid extremely well, and then nobody did anything about it. The ministries that paid them would stack up the reports on bookshelves and in desks, and that would be the end of it. Uh, today, there's a new model, which those interested in innovation in public sector should know about and you can call them a kind of a, a do tank rather than think tank. Organizations such as MindLab in Copenhagen, the uh, Design Innovation Center of the Danish government, CITRA, uh, the Finnish Innovation Fund, which is doing the same. And I wanted to talk a little about this on the academic side of GovHack. Um, I was really delighted to hear about this question of risk and of slack that came up because innovation requires slack. Slack is required for any learning process because it's an investment. Uh, organizational learning, individual learning, all the processes that we require for knowledge creation require Slack. One reason universities generate knowledge is that we have significant Slack built into our systems. Uh, the era of austerity and efficiency are a huge threat to what universities were put here to do. Universities create new knowledge, they also preserve existing knowledge. Now that itself has a tension, and that tension threatens innovation. Universities educate citizens who serve everybody, and they train professionals, uh, which in fact also has a built-in tension because it's the job of professionals, like Statistics Canada, to take things, hide them from everybody else, regulate them, and then sell them back to their original owners. The issue that really struck me when Sam was talking about solutions looking for problems is always that the problem comes first. Innovation is always embedded in the context. The context speaks and puts a problem forward. And the worst aspect of consulting firms as well as design consultancies and university design schools is they often involve solutions, really cool solutions looking for problems. Innovation. There's incremental innovation which we all know about, the slow creep of things, the evolution of the wheel, the fork, the hammer, or even computers in the last couple of decades versus radical innovation. But all human systems, which is to say governments, are open systems, and therefore they're connected to prior cultures, which means almost all the innovation that we can get involved in must be incremental. Why is innovation so difficult? because human organizations, societies, and cultures are like an iceberg. 90% is below the waterline. All that invisible stuff you can't see. But it's worse because the iceberg is embedded in an ocean with currents that move slowly. And those currents are also cultures and the other systems and cultures to which we're connected. Now, culture is good stuff. It preserves and it protects us. It carries the memories of all the evolutionary heritage that we've actually spent five or 10 million years building up and two and a half million years creating since we made the first tools long before we had language. But culture does this by preventing change. Within this, people look to find better ways forward, testing, trying things, implementing. But there's something to remember. This old phrase, the exception that proves the rule, is misunderstood. Exceptions teach us where to look. And the word prove in that phrase comes from the ancient times when words like prove and try meant to experiment, to test. Government innovation is the great question of human evolution. If you look, for example, at the UK, they've evolved the government 
over a thousand years. Uh, going back to the Battle of Stanford Bridge, where the English King Harold defeated Harold of Norway and saved England from the Vikings, whereupon he marched 300 miles south and got defeated at Hastings with a worn out army after a miraculous forced march. You got a feudal system, so you have governments that we're still struggling with. Are we going to be feudal, central, top down, or are we going to be local, distributive, and connected? And in those days, by the way, kings were elected. That was what the wapentake was about. Everybody went with their shields, a bunch of people stood up and said, so-and-so ought to be king, and if enough guys waved their shield in the air, that would be the king. We have had this tension for a long, long time. And Deborah was talking about what back to normal means, reversion to mean. Well, the long lines of history have a lot to do with all this. Uh, I'll wrap it up by bringing two metaphors forward. When I came in here, I got really scared. I saw one of the sponsors is Palantir. Now, any of you who know Lord of the Rings, remember the Palantir is this device. Pippin Took looks into it. Gandalf has to rescue him and get him out of the way of the all-seeing eye. This is technology. But technology also offers opportunities. Evolution, choice, innovation. I will mention a name. Write it down. You can Google it. Luke L-U-C Petton, P-E-T-T-O-N. I was reading the New York Times and I saw a wonderful article about a choreographer whose dancers dance with swans and horses. And then you Google, you go to his website, you can see some of these dances. And I'm thinking to myself, evolution, choice, and innovation together create the poetics of dance. Poetics originally means the act of making. Making, meaning, and alas, the struggle that we've been carrying with us for the last 2.5 million years. And this is the struggle of innovation. Okay, well, we'll jump to questions. That was a fantastic um, group of presentations. Thank you all very much. I'm going to ask one question, and then I'm going to turn to you guys to get your thinking caps on. No more silence for this time. Uh, the first question I'll just ask is, um, we've had a lot of speakers today, and we've seen over the last week uh, a lot of the benefits of open government data. So I guess I'd like to uh, address the panel with uh, your thoughts about uh, opening up research data, not just data, but the code that is publicly, often publicly funded out of um, research institutions and the benefits that that might create for other researchers and for the general public. And we will find a microphone now for them, for the front panel. No, is there one up there already? Oh, is there one up there? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Feel free. All of you, please. <laughs> just one comment. That way, yeah. Um, I think the, um, the recent um, issue of, was it Nature published the, the, a lot of information on the influenza mm. virus mutation? That's actually quite a good example of, there are risks in that. I, I think in general the principle is good, that's publicly funded, the, that a lot more information should be released. But um, in a previous job I dealt with the European Commission and they were funding fundamental work in DNA that could be linked, that could have been used to create genetic weapons. Mm. Because they have no national security apparatus in the European Commission, it never occurred to them, they were in this sort of public good thing, it never occurred to them that that could be extremely dangerous. So you would have to put mechanisms in place that sort of watch out type stuff. But mm. otherwise, I think it's a good principle to get, get the stuff out there. That next one? Oh, while you're at that end, okay. <laughs> I think most of us would agree with in principle. I think we also have to be careful about some of the research that is funded is done, that a lot of the data that we get is done on the understanding that we're not going to share that data. So it's not that we can't do it, it's that often we've agreed ethically with the organisations that we're in that we won't do it. We're using it, we can use aggregate data which we do publish. So I think it's just about being careful about many of the data sets are actually only, we only get the data set because mm -hmm. we promised not to share the data set. Sure. So that's not to say we shouldn't be doing it, but we need to think about the implications of that. Okay. Anyone else? Um, my bias would be in favor of uh, making data available. Um, and you know, with, with data sets, obviously there are ways that you can clean them and mask mm -hmm. individual identities and, and so on. Um, but uh, replication is uh, an important uh, method of, uh, of research, and it's important to have 
your data out there so that other people can play with it um, to, uh, in a sense, validate it and also see if it, it can be taken in different directions. Mm -hmm. Peer review does seem to be a, sort of important in academia. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say yes, uh, going open with the data would, is a fantastic uh, goal to have. And I know in Europe they're going to great efforts to try and uniformise data because it's not very well to say put data out there and then everyone can do stuff with it. Well, actually, if it isn't all uniform or it's not clear how it's generated, et cetera, et cetera, you can't actually do anything with it. So I would say it's not the holy grail either. So, for instance, as a company, if I was faced with a whole stack of data, I'd look and think, well, where on earth do I start? You know, it's all very well saying everything's going to open, but then what do you do with it? Mm -hmm. Maybe you're better off making sure that what, you're, what the data you're asking people to collect and what you want them to do with it is clear up front, so you're making use of the data with the people who are generating the data in the first place. Um, so yeah, I'd say it's not the holy grail, but it's definitely a, a good thing to be, to be doing. And that's an interesting point about, um, um, I mean, sometimes you don't know what those uh, outcomes are going to be. So I mean, yeah. Um, just my comment is, data is just a great platform. It's not innovation. I think that's yeah. the key. Um, so let's move on to Sarah's point. It's who's going to use it, why, they, why do you want it, and how do you recombine it? I don't think we've really got it clear inside universities who is those recombinations. But I put the question back to you, and then I'm going to turn to you guys, um, that um, if you're asking someone to define how they're going to use it and what they're going to get out of it up front, then you're actually stifling innovation, possibly. I don't know. My suggestion is not to, to um, okay. define it that way. It's actually, you've got all these great data sets. When you recombine that, who does that recombination? Perfect. For what purpose? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Any other comments from the panel? From an educational point of view, I suppose we saw today with the work that Lockie was doing, what are the opportunities for these data sets to become educational resources, mm. to, to make accessible, I suppose, innovative practices within schools as well? Just one more quick comment. Um, there's also some great open um, approaches to, to data, such as Kaggle. I don't know, how, how many of you have heard of Kaggle? Mm. Yeah, so there's a great example of people have generated data, but they are, can't actually do what they want to do with it. So make it open so that then you can have thousands or millions of people around the world to analyze it as well. Perfect. Okay. Uh, questions? Oh, we have one down the front here from uh, John. And if you wouldn't mind putting your hands up so I can spot you ahead of time and then we can get microphones around. Thanks, Dad. Just keep talking. John Sheridan from uh, the Australian Government Information Management Office. I think we'd all agree that innovation is a good thing. And I think we'd probably also agree that one of the prices or the costs of innovation is occasional failure. The challenge for government, I think, is deciding what percentage of your taxes should go into failure from the outset. And I was wondering if you'd comment on that, please. Jeez. That's, that's the big question. I'm, I'm sitting here laughing because I'm thinking to myself, in fact, so much of what happens in all human institutions, governments, universities, medicine, actually turns out to be failures anyhow that a great deal of what happens when government is not permitted to fail as they struggle to serve the public really involves disguising true failures by making things seem to be a success. I can't, again, I won't say, uh, being that all universities compete with all of the universities, one of the things I've noticed is there's a couple of organizations or parts of them that we compete with from time to time and what astonishes me is how many times they've gotten huge multi-million dollar grants or contracts out of the government. Nothing comes of it, but by the time they're required to be accountable, it's five years later, and there's a new government, and they, if it works, they don't want to know about it because the old government did it, and if it fails, they don't care, and they're just going to leave it be. Uh, so in fact, a lot of the question that you're asking really it's deep, what we should be asking is the nature of true failure, what we can learn from failure, how we turn failure into something usable for each next iterative, whether it's the opposition or us or another ministry or somebody else. Perhaps you could collaboratively fail as well. So instead of thinking it's just um, government that's gonna do the failing, perhaps you need to have networks of people that are willing to have a go at something with you um, and that spreads your risk a bit as well, so in terms of the, the risk, risk side of things. Well, and that actually nails the, the stuff I was talking about. We, we work in partnership with a number of government departments doing explicitly more risky experimental stuff. And I was once whinging to a member of parliament in the um, 
in the car park over something saying, you know, we're being set up, we'll be blamed if this particular thing doesn't work by different, you know, core state governments of state, departments of state, if you like. And he said, that's precisely why you're valuable. Because, mm. so that the collaborative interface allows government to displace the risk of failure through the part, into the part of the partnership that can afford to fail, which could be a university or a think tank or business, um, because we have to accept that um, failure in, in that sense is something governments have to try and avoid doing, and that's, I think, why the collaborative stuff is actually, beyond being a fatuous comment, is actually it's a serious comment about the value of collaboration between government and other sectors. I would add that uh, pilot studies are, it is, it's better to do pilot studies before you do national rollouts. And, okay, I mean, pilot studies are the opportunity to fail, to learn, and to correct it before you uh, inflict a misguided uh, program on the entire nation. And again, I suppose, going back to schools again, I mean, how do we actually learn from our mistakes? If we're talking about a, a sort of a pedagogical approach, particularly with children, um, how do we ensure that failure is actually seen as something that more to do with experimentation, to do with play, and ultimately learning from those mistakes? Yeah, I think building on that one again, I mean, one of the things we often do is we do, we do a pilot and then we do a review, but a lot of the, about the review is to tell ourselves how well it went. Mm. Whereas what we actually need to do is ask ourselves, well, why did it go well? Are the, what are the bits that we're actually not that happy about? And, and actually challenge ourselves about was it as successful as it could be before it rolls out? Because I do think we tend to find out the bits that we like rather than necessarily being open about it. And then just the last one, yeah, failure you can definitely measure as return on investment, but if you measure it in terms of value of lessons learned, I mean, there's many companies out there who have failure, failure awards for those groups who've actually failed the greatest but had the greatest lesson learned. And I think if you take that culture into your business, you've got a very different outcome of what failure is. Uh, questions? There's one coming over there, yes? Hi, um, Alex Marsden from PMC, going out a bit of a limb here. Um, you're talking about, I'm out, uh, you're talking about um, uh, government sort of exporting their failure, their risk of failure. Shouldn't we really be talking about the fact there needs to be a change in government thinking so that government is allowed to fail? And that's, if you're actually really wanting to look at a culture of innovation throughout government, there needs to be that ability and that space to do that. That, of course, leads to broader questions about um, public expectations of government and public um, slack. And there's a very interesting article by Michelle Grattan recently about that. That's a broader question, but really we should be thinking about expanding and having innovative culture within government, and that implies um, an understanding of failure early, quickly, things like that. I'll take that as a comment. Yep. Uh, oh, hold on. Uh, no, did someone want to say something? Okay. And this is all being recorded, isn't it? But it is being yeah, recorded. It is being live streamed. You have an audience. Okay. Um, so just agreeing with you, I think we actually have to re-engineer our democratic process mm. in order to allow government to have more of an appetite for risk and failure. So a greater sort of emphasis on deliberative democracy experimental would lead to experimental governance, which would make that happen. But a very adversarial political situation where people say, this is a complex thing, thing elect me and I'll fix it. That kind of narrative um, is just anti-ethical to the kind of vision for governance that you're talking about. I think I'll just throw a quick point in there and take my you know, place at the microphone. Um, the, also, it's interesting to note that um, we've spoken about uh, government, industry and academia, but no one's actually mentioned community engagement, so that's also an interesting player in communicating that message. But uh, anyway, any other questions? Down at the front here, please. This will have to be, okay, that question, then this one, and then that's the last one, and uh, you'll have to come and chat to these people during the lunch break, so we'll try to keep it on time. So thank you. Uh, okay, my question is related to... Um I was got a bit confused by the idea that you could measure innovation because mm. innovation means you need to do something differently either because you're not meeting success or you end up redefining success. So you try something new and does it work? Yes, you do it again. No, you try something again. So either way, you kind of end up with a process um, and then people get stuck in that process. So I'm just, you know, uh, what's, what's your recommendation on how to maintain flexibility generally? Just a simple idea on that. Yeah, kind of. I mean, you're right. That's one of our biggest problems is we, we try to measure it because we have to evaluate it. And by doing that, we usually kill it. 
Um, I think one of the things is, is, saying is, is trying to work out what is the outcome that you wanted. So if we think about the examples we had earlier on, many of them were trying to achieve quite clear changes in, in some of the practices that they were doing. And you could actually establish why they were doing those things. And so you can actually work out, well, if that's where we want to go, the measurement is, are, are we managing to move towards that area? So it's not that we've got an innovation, but we're moving towards the change in outcomes that we want and the innovation will do that. I mean, and that's what I was thinking when I was saying about trying to work out what it looks like when it works. What is it that you want to be different in your world that is not there now? Now, that's really difficult, big step changes, but it, it works quite well for when you're trying to think about, you know, well, something that we're doing at the moment is causing us a difficulty. If we're not careful, we get very, very focused on the problem. If we take ourselves out of the problem and identify what a working solution looks like, then we can start to move towards that. And then we can start to say, well, that's what we look to measure towards. One of the interesting things in the States at the moment is an enormous amount of push about trying to measure progress. So there's an example going around at the moment that they were trying to increase energy levels. Um, and one of the ways, um, uh, environmental energy that was being pumped into the grid. And the target was, I didn't really understand the science, okay, but it was 9,000 somethings. Um, and they hit 6,000 somethings. So the question is, is that a failure or a success? Well, they've only ever done 1,500 before. In learning to get to 6,000, they've learned an enormous amount. And now they're going to set for 12,000. But they've now got to deal with this other problem that government thinks they failed. Mm. Right, so but, so that it, there's all this issue of how to measure progress. And I think it's about trying to identify the progress, in, and that's where we can go. Uh, can I say something perhaps a little bit trite, but it's hire the right people, um, and then incentivise them and, and celebrate success. Beautiful. All right, quick question down the front here, and then we'll wrap up. Hi, Stephen Davis of Human Services. Um, at, at the risk of going out on that limb a little bit further, my mind races ahead to the suggestion that we are more tolerant of failure within government. Uh, that we would actually then get maybe a quota that governments have to achieve in terms of the failure in each of their departments and then... Uh, and, and of course, um, that may uh, lead to some inefficiencies as well. But uh, do you have any ideas on how best to measure the, the benefits of failure and how to package them uh, for public consumption and for, for government consumption? Because I think this is a real issue for mm. innovation. Yeah. Well, one response, years ago, I used to work, do quite a lot of partnership work with the aerospace industry in the US and the UK. And if you deal with companies like Rolls-Royce Aerospace and those kind of characters at the high-tech end, they managed their ideas pipeline that would lead to R&D in a very Darwinian manner. They generate lots of concepts and they weed them out. They use these, this thing called stage gate methods where you define filters and you do exploratory high-risk work and then you narrow it down and throw more and more money at things. But they're very, very good at when they kill ideas. They, so they do the fail earlier, fail early that we heard about. But they extract the lessons from that and make sure they keep that corporate memory as best they can by retaining people. And by the, when they go and retire, they go and work in universities and they keep picking their brains there as consultants. Say, oh, well, you did that 20 years ago. What did you learn? So that kind of thing is that you kill things off, but you don't treat the, the failure is always a lesson. And you make sure you capture those lessons. And I think that kind of ethos would work in government well. If we get past this thing, but reviews and evaluations aren't, you know, are, are an opportunity to learn, mm. even from failure. And we were pretty bad in government um, at retaining those lessons and using them in the future, reusing them. I'll, I'll just be a very quick one. Uh, check out a website that NGOs have developed. In fact, I think um, Engineers Without Borders in uh, Canada developed it, which, where they celebrate failure. And the reason they celebrate it is to share those failures so that they all learn from it and they don't do it themselves. So I think that would be one thing, would be you know, share it with each other. Don't have your silos, all learn from it. Um, just from a design perspective, you know, we, we introduced the design critique. The notion of actually getting your teams together to critique ideas rather than deconstruct ideas. And it's that behaviour that we actually you know, build upon that work constantly and daily and actually take those lessons away. I think some of the behaviours you can actually start to bring into your own firm or department. I'll just ask a very quick question of the, and then we'll, we'll finish. What do you think about the idea of um, the 20% playtime that Google and Academia are, and several companies are now starting to Im implement as a way to minimise the risk but also encourage innovation? 
Um, and some I've seen IT projects where they take 10% of the budget of the project and put that towards you know, a, a crack team to try to compete against the 90% project and see what they can do. What do you reckon about those kinds of approaches? Um, from my perspective, it's based on sector-specific projects. And you know, when you want an IT project where it doesn't take a lot of capital intensive resources, you can do that. You can prototype fast. For other um, sectors, it's not that easy. But the 20% playtime? Even yeah, the 20% yeah. playtime. Um, so you, taking 20% off, it doesn't give you enough time to actually scale up that idea into something significant. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I would agree. I think it's got to be context specific. I mean, I can think of you know various places where you can't have 20% of what is basically slack time. Mm. It's okay if that means that you can see that there's going to be really clear things coming out of it. What I think it's about is making space for people to experiment. And so for each organisation, they need to think about where is the room to experiment and think. I mean, what we don't do is get time to think. Mm. So if you're not careful what happens with the 20% playtime is people then have to present what they did. I mean, I've started to see that happen. Yeah. So I think it's about saying, right, where do we make space for people to think and experiment and meet with each other, etc. cetera? Um, I think uh, playtime or something like it is very important. Um, unfortunately, if what governments are doing is uh, running attrition policies where uh, people who retire don't get replaced so that those who stay on have to work harder and harder, um, it will be impossible to give people the uh, um, slack time with which to, uh, to ponder and come up with new ideas. I'd like to, uh, picking up on Alex's point, this is Prime Minister Cabinet can make this suggestion. Uh, we have a 20% playtime Cabinet Committee. That, quite, that could be quite useful. Brilliant. Any last comments there from the floor? Okay, I might close it there.